When it comes to elementary music, one of the easiest ways to make your lessons more exciting is to add instruments. However, instruments can be a whole thing if you don't know how to have classroom management for instruments. I'm reminded of a time when during open house, my principal wanted me to bring out some instruments for the kids to just play like during open house and we're in the middle of the hallway and it was basically just a free for all. Now I picked very carefully, so nothing that I picked was something that was gonna break easily, um, but it was not structured, not anything. And one of the teachers came up to me and was like, I cannot believe you do this all day. Like that would drive me crazy. And I was like, this is not what my classroom sounds like. This is mass chaos. My classroom is calm, cool, collected. We have a great time and we sound, you know, better than that at least, but it is not chaotic and loud like that. So if you would like to have a nice, like calm, cool, collected classroom and not a crazy, you know, free for all, then this video is for you. We're going to talk about some like principles of different things that you should do for classroom management for instruments. We'll also get into some specific things for like specific instruments, like things I do with drums, things I do with rhythm sticks, all that kind of stuff. So there's, there's a lot going on. I'll timestamp everything for you here. So you can flip flop to, you know, wherever you need to go, or if you need to go back to something else to rewatch something or, you know, all the things there you go let's get started now before we get to the actual instruments you got to make sure you prep the students adequately for the instruments you do not just go like here's some instruments and then expect them to do the right thing because that's not a thing as soon as they get instruments in their hand everything is so much harder because they're so excited and they want to play the instruments and because of that you need to make sure that you prep them accordingly so before we ever get instruments number one we always practice first okay so when before we get instruments we do everything on body percussion first so if we're playing along with the song we're going to do body percussion first and then we'll add instruments later that way when they get to the instruments they already know what to do and so the only new thing is the instrument and not the whole whole thing make sure that they already know what to do before they get the instruments in their hand because it's going to make life so much easier secondly before we get our instruments we're also going to talk about the expectations so how i typically do this is i'll say we're going to play the instruments we're going to do xyz with the instruments but when we use our instruments we're going to do the same four things that we do all the time in music class repeat after me and then i always clap our rules in music class so i'll do follow directions be respectful be responsible be a participant so for each of those i'll clap one they clap it back and so that they're like you know remembering all the things and then i'll say hmm do you think responsible people throw their instruments and they're like no do you think responsible people like bang their instruments super super hard and they're like no oh great do you think respectful people like steal instruments from other people like, no and so we talk about how the rules apply to what we're doing right now with the instruments it seems excessive it is excessive do it anyway because this is how you get the magic to happen and you get the class under control they need to know exactly what you expect before the instruments are in their hand so we start with our rules we talk about how the rules apply to instruments with some of the rules we'll also talk about the why so specifically, if we're using rhythm sticks, um, I have like linoleum in my room and then I, we sit on carpets. And so I always tell them we can tap our sticks together or we can tap them on the carpet. Are we gonna tap them on the hard ground? And they say no, and I say, why not? And then usually they're like, cause they'll break. They're probably not gonna break, but I'm like, yeah, they could break. Um, and then I'm like, what's another reason? They're like, oh, it's super loud. I'm like, yeah, if we all tap on the hard ground, it's gonna be super, super loud. And then we're all gonna have headaches and we're not gonna wanna play the instruments. And then Miss Davis is not gonna let you play the instruments because I'm gonna have a headache and we're not here for that. So make sure you tap on the carpet or sticks together. So little things like that, if you tell them why, they're gonna be a lot more likely to actually do the right thing. In general, always explain to kids why we're doing things. We're not just doing things to do things. We always have a reason, but you know, kids don't realize that. They don't realize you have a reason. They just think you're being a tyrant. So tell them why, and then they're like, oh, that makes sense. And then they're less likely to do it. Now, it's not that they're not gonna do it, but they're less likely to do it. Then comes passing out the instruments. So when you're passing out instruments or when you're picking up instruments, you need to be very deliberate with what you have the students do in order to make sure that this is a calm, 
situation because it can be super hot mess, super loud. So I have a couple of different ways that we pass out and pick up instruments. To pass them out, either I will pass them out. So especially with like egg shakers, cast in as like little things. Sometimes I just come through and hand them to all the students. Um, and other times I have the kids come and get them. So when we do it that way, my kids sit in rows. So I'll say red row because they're sitting on the red dots stand up, they come this way, they get their instruments, they go around, back to their seat, set them down. And whichever way I do that, I always say, get your instrument, put it all the way on the floor, put your hands up on your shoulders. And then I'll tell them, if your hands are on your shoulders, are you touching your instrument? They're like, no, I'm like, great. So if I hear sound, somebody's not following directions. Um, so I am very fussy about that because, especially with the littles, with the older kids, I'll tell them, put your instrument down, take your hands all the way off, and I tell them, you can put them on your shoulders, you can cross them, you can put them in your pockets, put them behind you, I don't care. But with like second grade and under, we always put it on our shoulders because when you look out, it's easy to see that your hands are on your shoulders. So I know that if your hands are not on your shoulders, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. And if I hear noise, it's gonna be obviously the person that doesn't have their hands on their shoulders. So that really helps um, either way to cut down on noise when the kids get their instruments, okay? When I'm picking up instruments, um, sometimes, again, I'll just come through with the bucket and have the kids set theirs in. Sometimes we do where they come all the way up to the front and put their instrument away and go back to their seats. And sometimes we pass them to the front and to the middle. And then the two kids in the front middle put them into the bucket. And so those are my three ways that we pick up instruments. Um, which one we do depends on how much time we have, what class it is, all sorts of different things, and what instrument we're using and all that kind of stuff. So it just kind of depends on what's going on. Um, when we are picking up instruments though, I will mention that in order to make sure that they're not being noisy when you're picking up the instruments, I tell them, if you put your instruments up responsibly and nobody plays their instrument, then we will get two points for teacher versus student points, okay? If anybody plays their instruments, I will earn a point. Now, I only get one point if they mess up, they get two points if they do it correctly, but that's usually enough to keep them pretty good. And then if they don't, if someone does play, they get real upset about it. And then the next time it doesn't happen again. So that's a little thing I do to kind of hold it over their shoulders because that's a struggle when you're done and you're picking them up. How do you keep them quiet at that point and not messing with them? Which brings me to the next point, which is a little phrase that I stole from Mrs. King's music room. I love her. She's amazing. If you don't follow her, um, I will link her website down below. She has an Instagram. She's awesome. She has like great resources. Highly recommend it following her. But one thing that she says that I now say is the phrase, if you play before I say, I will take your instrument away. Okay, so this is the phrase that I tell the students every single time we get instruments from kindergarten to fifth grade. When I taught pre-K, I told it to the pre-K kids. And usually the first time, especially I'll say it twice, and I really make a big deal about it, and I look them all in the eye when I say it. I'm like, if you play before I say, I will take your instrument away. And I usually say, the very first time, because they don't realize that I actually mean the first time. And then I'll give some examples. So I'll say, okay, so if I'm supposed to have my hands up on my shoulders, my instruments on the floor, and I hear people shaking their egg, then I will take it. If you're playing while I'm talking, I will take it. If I put my hands on my shoulders, you put your hands on my sh on your shoulders, and if you're playing, then I will take it. And if we're all playing what we're supposed to, and this is always their favorite, like if we're all playing like, you know, let us chase the squirrel, and you're over there like, I will take it and they like giggle and they think it's so funny, but I'm not kidding. Um, so I really do mean it too. I'm, I'm not like, oh, I just say it and then it doesn't happen again. No, no, no friends. If they touch the instrument when they are not supposed to, it goes away. The first time I tell them, this is your warning. You don't get another warning. And let me tell you the first time that I did this, it was like a fourth grade class the first time I ever did this. I will never forget the kid's face. The first person who played it and then I took it and he was like, complete shock. And I was like, 
I told you. And now my kids are very used to me because I've been at my same school for years. So they already know that if they play before I say, I will take your instrument away. They usually say it with me and they know, and I know, and like we all know that it's a thing and it's happening and I don't want to hear it. Um, now, is it mean? Yes. Is it necessary? Also, yes. Now, I will, um, if they do get their instrument taken, I tell them they can play their pretend instrument. So like, here's my pretend egg shaker. Um, and then I typically will give it back after like a minute or two. If they are doing it again, then they lose it for the whole rest of the time and I will not give it back. Um, I also usually tell them, you might get it back if I'm in a good mood today and if I'm feeling nice. And then sometimes I'll be like, do you think I'm feeling nice? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, hmm, I don't know about that. And they all kind of look at me like, this lady's crazy. Yes, I am crazy. But you know what else? The kids behave well for me. <laughs> so I don't care. Um, the next point is a lot nicer. And that is make sure you keep the kids busy. So anytime that you have the kids with instruments, not playing their instruments, their little brains are like freaking out because they're like, I must touch the instrument. So make sure you keep them busy as much as possible. Minimize transitions, go, 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 go. Typically like if we're doing something in particular and I need like a time filler, we'll just play along with a song that we have learned or I'll put a song on and we'll keep the beat or something like that so that they're not just sitting there for a long time with nothing to do. You don't want that because you know, I'll hands are the devil's playthings, and it's very true with the instruments. Keep them busy as much as possible and they will do much better. Next up, having instrument positions. So I didn't bring any instruments home because you know what? I'm filming this in July for January. Man, look at me being on top of things. So I'm gonna use my pens. Um, so if I have rhythm sticks, we have three music instrument positions. We have Magic X, Magic X is quiet, instruments are together, they're not making noise, and I can see them. Then we have ready. Ready means I'm ready to go, I'm ready to play, but I'm not playing yet. And the last one is rest. Rest means sticks are all the way down, hands are up on your shoulders or you know wherever so that you're not messing with them. But when your sticks are resting or your instruments are resting, they are asleep and they don't make noise. So those are our three positions. I've also seen and used um, people having the kids You can also have the kids put theirs on their shoulders. That's pretty useful. Or sometimes if we're, if I'm talking, I'll have them point to their ears or point to their head so that they can think. Um, those are helpful just as like little things, but typically we do magic X, ready and rest. And so those are our three positions. They know magic X and ready are both quiet. And then rest is, they're all quiet. They're all quiet, but they're just different. I don't know. We use them. Um, they're all quiet, but we use them and then playing position would be like actually actively playing but we don't usually talk about that because we don't need to and we do that also like it works really well with sticks and mallets um we also do them with other things so we'll have a tambourine and it'll be like here's your tambourine here's your magic x okay we, we magic x with whatever we got because it keeps them quiet and they know it and it's a thing and that's where we are next up when it comes to instrument management one of the best things you can do is choose your instruments wisely so <laughs> some instruments are louder than others some instruments are more annoying than others and you want to make sure that you choose things according to what your activity is so they make sense but also choose them carefully to make sure that the chaos level isn't too crazy so especially with little kids we'll typically have everyone using the same instrument for the most part with the littles and then with the older kids is when i start doing more of like multiple different instruments make sure those go together though so if you have like drums and your drums are really loud pick other instruments that are quieter okay so like we'll do like drums and then maybe like triangles and then like rhythm sticks or egg shakers like something you know so that it's like not super loud there's only one thing going on um other things like i really 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 don't like metallophones sorry but they drive me bonkers and especially when you have metallophones and xylophones together, they give me headaches. So I am always gonna pick a xylophone over a metallophone because I just like the sound better and they're less chaotic to me and that's how I feel. I do occasionally add in metallophones, but for like specific things, but I'm gonna go for the xylophones every time instead. So be 
careful about like what instruments you pick and the chaos level of those instruments and what you're doing. Like if you're singing a folk song and you're using drums, then the kids are gonna have to sing really loud to be able to be heard. Versus if you're singing a folk song and you're using it in maraca, the kids can be heard a lot better. It's gonna be a lot easier. Next up, if you are swapping between different instruments, you can have non-instrument groups. Now, some people like to have like a singing group and then, you know, the instrument groups. I actually don't like that because they always get really disappointed when they're in the singing group and I don't want them to think of singing as like a punishment or like a disappointing thing. I always want to be exciting. So instead, I do things like a movement group like if we have actions then they're the ones that are doing the actions or um we did oh what did we do we did the song see the dragon come a few months ago with my second graders and everyone got a scarf that was their dragon and so the kids who are not playing were using their dragons and they were making their dragons fly around the room the other kids were playing drums or triangles and then we swapped and so that was like you know it's fun to play with the scarves and so it wasn't a big deal if you're not playing or if you are gonna have a singing group, I would suggest keep everyone like at their seats and just call up a couple kids to the instruments and then swap them out. That's gonna feel a lot better than being like, and you guys are the singing group and you don't get to touch anything because then you're gonna be like, oh, I wanna play instruments. That's the whole thing. Now, let's talk about some specific classroom management for specific instruments. So first of all, a couple, these are, we're gonna roll through these really quickly. Um, Drums, do not let the kids lean on the drums so the kids should not have their hands on the drums if they are not playing them so they're not their hands don't rest on the drums they especially do not push on the drums when they stand up make sure you're very fussy about that because those drum heads will get messed up and they will break and they will bend and we don't want that to happen so all that for smaller drums i always have them flip the drums upside down when they're not playing so that like the drum head is on the bottom this is a couple of things number one it's um harder for them to play when they're not supposed to we like that number two if someone act if kids are like moving around the room if somebody accidentally steps on the drum it's going to be less likely to break if it's you know upside down like a bowl than if it's correct so that's just a little thing that i do in order to have that um, and number three, have kids practice playing at different volumes because they're automatic when they get to drums, it's gonna be like, ha ah. ha. So make sure you practice like, now we're gonna play quietly. Now we're gonna play loud. Now we're gonna play in the middle. And so like get, have them get kind of a feel for all of that so that they understand that it can sound different so that they'll understand what level they need to play at. Now with rhythm sticks or drumsticks, again, um, don't play always play on the carpet, not on tile or linoleum. If you have hard ground only, you can get um, like mouse pads or like pieces of foam or carpet squares, or even y'all have some really, really, really old textbooks. And so sometimes we use textbooks and we bang on the textbooks with our drumsticks because it makes actually a really cool sound. And it's not as loud as the hard ground is because it muffles it a little bit. So those things are things that'll muffle the sound a little bit. So it's just not super, super, super loud. Um, and take advantage of that magic X recorders not my favorite but with recorders make sure you emphasize low and warm air that's going to prevent some of the squeaking um have students play in small groups so instead of doing everything whole group have like okay this is you know this group's turn to play and then this group can play and then this group can play and then maybe we all play together that's a good way to like get some of the noise down a little bit and also i always with recorders get kids that are like i can't hear myself so if they're doing it it's Small groups they're more likely to be able to hear themselves play which is you know always a really big thing um you can have recorder partners so have two kids that are like recorder partners and you can have one play while the other watches and helps and then they can swap so that way you only have half the kids playing at one time so it's not as loud and it gives the added benefit of their fingers don't hurt as much from you know like gripping the um holes really hard and they also are helping the other students so they're getting more knowledge about like how to play and those are always good things um if kids are not doing things correctly on the recorders you can take the mouthpiece off and have them just do the fingerings or you can take the whole instrument and have them just do the fingers like this or with like a pencil they can just hold a pencil and do it that way those are a couple things you can do um and then the last thing is before they play 
you play whatever the song is that you're working on. You play it, have them listen, and then play it and have them practice the fingers because that's gonna help them to know kind of what to do before they get the instrument and they have to focus on blowing and, you know, fingering. If they just finger it, then they're a little more prepared for that. Um, and they can hear what it's supposed to sound like, which means they're more likely to play it correctly. Um, with barred instruments, always put it on body percussion first. So we'll do things like if we're doing do re mi patterns, we might do, you know, mi re do, mi re do, and do something like that so they can get it kind of in their bodies first. Um, or sometimes literally I'll play and I have the kids just pretend to play. I flip my xylophone around backwards and then I'll play and have the kids pretend to play with me with their hands so that they're getting used to like which way their hands move and all of that stuff. Um, make sure the kids know which way is high and which way is low. If they understand the xylophone, they're going to be better at it just in general. It's going to be easier. Um, anytime the kids are going to get up from the xylophones, tell them to scoot away and then stand up because if they're right up on the xylophone and they stand up, it's gonna knock it over and it's gonna be like hot mess. So have them scoot back and then stand up and do not step over the xylophones. Ever. And with ukuleles, this is gonna be my last one, um, do not let the kids touch the pegs until they know how to use them. Do not touch the pegs until you have actually taught them how to use them. I tell them if you touch the pegs, I will take your ukulele and you will not play for the rest of the day um, because it's just, it's just, it's just a whole thing into itself. Um, emphasize how hollow and fragile they are because the kids are always surprised by how light they are um, and that they can break. And so just, you know, be careful with that um, and really emphasize setting them down nicely on the floor when they're not playing them or setting them in their lap when they're not playing them and like being gentle with that. And lastly, ukulele partners is going to be really great if you have two kids playing ukulele. One, that means you only need half the ukulele. So if you don't have a class set, this can be helpful. Um, two, they can help each other. And three, again, their fingers start hurting after a while. So if they have a partner they can swap, then their fingers won't hurt quite as much, which is really, really handy and helpful. So that's pretty much all I got for today. That was kind of a lot, but that's going to give you a good, good sense of classroom management for instruments. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.